Hello, everyone. My name is Alpha Bakar Timbo, and I'm the founder and chief executive officer of ABT Coaching Company Limited. ABT Coaching is about helping people to explore life with less stress while building a successful mindset with their own narrative, by like creating their own narrative better. Also, we are into human resource management, consultancy, and mentorship. The Bloom series. The first season was entertaining, exciting, and incredible. So many lives you are touched, and you are able to explore life and unlock their true potential. The experience was wonderful. This is the second season, and it's going to be super exciting. I'm feeling pumped up and grateful to be part of this new series. So nice topic is career pathway. Many people are struggling to know their careers, and it's very challenging in this part of the world. So what is a career pathway? For starters, it is a system that creates clarity and structure, especially for students to know their livelihood of post-education completion. On the other hand, it is a path you make with your direct manager within uh, a company. The goal here is to climb the career ladder. Yet, the system is there, but unemployment, especially in West Africa, keeps increasing in astronomical numbers. How many times have we witnessed? How many times have we witnessed a situation where our college graduates? employees dreams find like chase their dreams uh in the wrong pathway of their career development when i finished my my studies at university i went into the profession of human resource management thinking that was my, my career pathway yes i enjoyed the 14 years experience working for one of the biggest companies in Sierra Leone. Despite the experience, I became stuck at the peak of my career in human resources. And it became impossible for me to improve my capabilities. Imagine how many people out there going to the same situation, into the same situation, and they might not be as lucky as I was. I believe you can create your own system of specialized knowledge that will help you, that will benefit you for eternity. Trust me, when you are able to align your purpose with your passion, you, your career pathway will blow up. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. Hi, I am Alpha Bakal Timo, a personal user coach and CEO of ABT Coaching Company Limited. At ABT Coaching, we help our clients to unlock their true potential and explore the gift of life to our system of coaching. Have you ever wondered why you struggle to set your goals? to be in a better relationship, unable to walk through the right paths of career development, discover your better passion, procrastinate on how to kickstart your business plans, challenging rights. Hmm. Our societies have corrupted our minds not to explore life as we should. And its narrative has forced us to be stuck in our comfort zone. But guess what? We have all the powers within us to walk the path that we want and stretch ourselves to be successful. 
If you feel life is all about staying in your comfort zone, then our coaching programs are not for you. But if you feel there is more to life and it's a must for life exploration, get in touch and prove to us that you're a great fit for our coaching programs. Cheers and see you on the other side. God bless. Sorry for that break in transmission. Um, just, just a quick reminder that um, we, we lost uh, internet connectivity and uh, electricity as we are going along the, the show. Um, if you are just uh, tuning in, this is the first episode of the ABT Bloom series. This is season two. And uh, tonight, our topic is career pathway. Um, um, <clears throat> our guest for tonight's topic is a chartered accountant and uh, is an internationally renowned tax expert and uh, he has worked for over 16 years in the tax authority in the, in the, in the NRA and uh, he was notably in charge of implementing the goods and services tax um, uh, in Sierra Leone. He also works for the IMF as an expert and the World Bank and the African, African Tax Administration Forum and uh, international consultancy firms. In addition yeah, to his professional life, he's the CEO of uh, Bet Farm, which is a, a huge company in Sierra Leone. And um, Bet Farm is uh, in charge of um, advice, uh, advice uh, tax advice uh, institution, wherein they help the the IN uh, clients. Our, our guest has a passion for the growth of entrepreneurship in the in Sierra Leone, having various investment interests, including the co-founding of the business business school in Sierra Leone. Peter Business School. His experience in the public and uh, private uh, sectors in Sierra Leone for close to two decades enabled him to easily navigate to the, inter uh, to the integrate regulatory and business environment in the country. He's a well grounded uh, person, wherein he's very experienced. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Alfred Akibo Betts. Thank you very much, um, Alpha, for um, asking me to join your show. Um, congratulations, first of all, for the progress I've seen you've made um, over this short period of time, because I think this is very important. And obviously, to all the viewers, it's obviously a pleasure for me to speak with Alpha today and also to answer his questions, but also your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alpha. Um, just a quick reminder, again, before we dive deep into the, into the conversation, this is a live discussion. And should we lose internet just like we did? Um, um, <laughs> or electricity? Please don't leave as we'll be right back. I invite you all to engage with each other in the comment section and to ask questions. Also, as you're watching, please share this conversation. Welcome again, Alfred. Thank you very much. Now, Alfred. In 2022, the unemployment rate in West Africa was 6.8%. I 
according to various reports. It depends on what each one you believe in. In the period under review, unemployment in the region, especially in, in West Africa, has risen more rapidly from 2016 to 2021, when it peaked at approximately 7 percent. However, by 2023, the rate is projected to decrease to 6.5 percent. Should we be positive, despite the challenges that keep presenting themselves, Alfred? Well, I think we should, because when you look at the figures, um, I guess it will be mainly due to um, uh, in COVID, like COVID time 2020, it's obvious that the unemployment rate increased. Um, I don't have the figures for Sierra Leone, but obviously, um, generally speaking, across the region, not only COVID, but the Ukraine-Russia um, conflict is causing challenges all across the world. But that's not the biggest thing, because I think the most important thing for each and every country is looking at what they could actually be able to do to ensure that they solve the problem internally. Because not all the time you'll just say um, or rely on maybe say it's because of the glo global shocks. There are many things that could be done um, internally in, in countries to be able to improve their unemployment rates because job creation is a very, very vital thing, especially when you talk about youth unemployment, et cetera, but also not only youth unemployment, but also looking for situations wherein if the economy is down, then obviously it affects many sectors. Um, there are some sectors that were affected during the COVID time, like the like the hospitality sector, which obviously is up and running now. So it means that if you want to improve um, employment in that particular sector, you need to improve your tourism. You need to improve what you're able to, to offer in terms of um, visitors coming into the country, but also internal tourism, because internal tourism sometimes looked at as if it's not that important. But um, what you also want is a situation where, where people are in their country they're also able to enjoy things in the country. So if you're able to provide toys packages for people internally, it means that I could um, actually improve. But broadly speaking, if we look at employment, there are many other things um, in the economy. Let's say for the saline economy, we rely heavily on the mining and extractive sector. Um, uh, so it means that if things are right in that particular sector, um, you'll have employment. Um, the mining sector is usually affected by global challenges um, in terms of um, it depends by the, the price of the commodities so if iron ore price is very very down it means that the mining companies that are um, extracting iron ore um, will be making a loss so maybe they will want to maybe uh, maybe cut down on employment but if it's up and their production is up it means that maybe they want more 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 staff uh, more staff to be able to run their mines the manufacturing sector is very, very vital. And when we're talking about the employment, it also links generally to the economy itself in the sense that um, if these sectors can boom, it also helps many, many other factors like um, our exchange rates, um, challenges that we're having um, uh, for, for the past year and a half to two years. Um, so these, all these things are very, very much linked. And obviously, if there's economic downturn and businesses are making losses, even small businesses will cut down and when small business is cut down, so for example, because of the challenges relating to, to, to the exchange rates in Sierra Leone, a lot of businesses are losing now. So obviously, if they're losing money, it means that they have to cut their staff, not only in the big sectors, but let's say, for example, if I'm employing um, um, uh, household staff and uh, my, my, the money I'm having is reducing in purchasing power, it means that I'll say maybe if I have two three staff i'll say let me cut it down to 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 maybe one or something like that for only only the necessity so i do see that it's a case-by-case -case basis for countries but it's very vital a country in a nutshell try to do some things to ensure that they're able to solve the the, the employment problem okay um thank you very much Alfred. that was so insightful um now let's let's delve into dive into the situation inside your you and I know unemployment is unfortunate you don't have the, the, the data, but um, it's, it's worrisome, okay? And uh, for me, I want to see a situation where I, you are a CEO of uh, Bet Farm, uh, which is like a good institution in the sense that you are, you are helping the young graduates come to in terms of career pathway. Now, how bad it is? In terms of say, you know, looking at the, the, the level of uh, unemployment rates, looking at just your experience, how you, you have helped your graduates. I also want to know the situation now at the state. 
Um, if, if we look with respect to the Betz Farm, um, uh, what we do is providing services to clients in terms of tax, accounting, um, regulatory, business advice, etc. And uh, more and more, we see that businesses do see that they need these services because it's mainly interaction with um, with government MDAs, mainly, let's say, with NRA or other government MDAs. So we make uh, the life very, very much easier for our clients in ensuring that we're able to make it easier to, let's say, file their return, pay for them, et cetera, so they don't run into problems. So more and more, not only big businesses, but small um, sole traders, et cetera, partnerships, they also see the need for our, for our services. For us, it was very vital um, that one of the things for us was um, uh, creating a business that was more oriented, client oriented. And when you have a client oriented business, it means that you need people that see the vision. And that vision, it means that everybody has to come into that particular culture um, uh, to be able to move everything forward. So you you have a situation where in clients, um, it is the thing, this cliche that says the client is always right, but in a different way, in the sense that you have to show the client that you care for the client. And for us, um, because we wanted to do that, not that we thought that people that are much, much more experienced in their work um, will not be able to do it. But we did see that um, for us, it was building a team. And we're like two and a half to three years in that now, building a team that was mainly made up of people that maybe had just came out of college or people that um, had a few years experience. But we also have people with more experience in the team, but that mix. But we prioritized having much younger um, professionals. and. Because we did that, it means that it's just like a child, right? A child, a baby, um, uh, showing the baby how to work, showing the baby, um, give the baby some training in, in the household in terms of how they interact with people. The simple thing that you tell your child that you have to tell adults, hello, um, good morning, and things like that. These are, these are, these are, these are values that you build up when, when you're growing up. So it's similar also to what we do at the Betz Farm in ensuring that our staff um are in line with what they should be as a professional like obviously coming to work on time uh, meeting deadlines if you have a problem have a discussion not having um an animal farm kind of culture where there's a lot of hierarchy but yes there's hierarchy but also ensuring that people are much more relaxed and obviously more importantly that builds to ensuring that we're able to provide better services for our clients so in looking generally speaking about the Full employment um, in in own employment um, situation in Sierra Leone. I don't have the data, um, but we obviously know that um, employment is not where we want it to be. Um, but I think what is very very important, as I explained um, in, in the previous question you asked, is ensuring that we not only the government but also at the private sector create value. So there are many many other things that it's not only dependent on government. Obviously, a lot of people do think that. It's all the time that you have to depend on government, but you also have to create value. So you have to be innovative. Um, things like, for example, when um, uh, we had the dot-com era, when we had the Facebook, the social media, etc. These are things that have been created. So it means that they're creating something. So it means that people in the private sector, just like how we've done for the Betz Farm, um, um, creating um, value by, by having a new service provider in that space, you're able to do things. We need people... To, to be able to say, okay, well, I'm not only going to be buying and selling all the time, importing things, because when you import things into the country, you're basically paying um, wages and salaries and taxes in other countries. Okay, let's start growing things in, in the country. You don't need government for that all the time. Go and find a piece of land, make a business plan to maybe do an agricultural company. From that, maybe think about doing agriculture. Think about maybe we have um, many, we have some companies now um, in the solar sector, creating electricity for people in the provinces, hard rich areas. These are things you could do. So you need to look at opportunities to be able to improve that. So I think if all of us in terms of the public sector and the private sector come together and work to ensure that we're able to do these things, and obviously it's important that the government creates a good, um, good business climate, then it means that we'll have more employment and things will obviously get better in terms of um, households having employment to be able to feed their families all right thank you very much Alfred. again that was insightful and uh i love the part that you mentioned the, the government and the private sector coming together now so many people would like to know or should i know 
but uh, I'd like you to share the step that you took when you uh, you discover your your true career pathway because you don't start as a as an accountant just like that. There are steps you took along the line, and now you're the CEO of Bet Farm and uh, you are expert in tax in different levels. You've been through the uh, the, the struggles. Okay, I just wanted to share that story so people can understand exactly how it feels like to go through this kind of path. It's a funny story to start. So, interestingly, my daughter is is um, at the stage where she's kind of like a little bit finding a career path in the sense of choosing a stream. You know, when you're going to O level class, that's the time you have to decide whether you go to art, science, or business, and things like that. And uh, when I was at that particular point in time, um, from three, same year, she is now coincidentally. Um, uh, it was very easy for me. Obviously, when you're growing up, you say you want to be a pilot, you want to be a fireman, all these crazy things. And when I went to Form 3, I did um, uh, accounting for the first time and I had 100%. It was way long. I had 100%. I wasn't, I was okay in school, but I wasn't the smartest because obviously I played a lot. You know how, how young boys are. So as soon as I had 100%, I say, I want to be an accountant. Obviously, I didn't know what a chartered accountant was at that particular point in time. So I just followed that career path, went to business and things like that. But looking at what I actually took, because obviously that was the first step, a funny step, but was the first decision as a 14-year-old. Um, so finishing college, you obviously you have a, a degree, a hottest degree in accounting. It's not like you... You obviously know that you're going to do an ACCA because that was a very natural thing at that particular point in time um, because all my colleagues um, in a honors class were going to do it. But it was between, okay, yes, you're going to be a chartered accountant, but being a chartered accountant it doesn't mean that that's your career path because being a chartered accountant, you could be many things, a finance expert, a tax person, a financial controller, you know, many, many other things. Um, so for me, was actually applying for a job at the National Urban Authority and started to work at the NIA. And I think even at that particular point in time, I didn't make a decision for a very, very long time that I wanted to be like a tax expert. But working there, progressing, um, I was in charge of the implementation of goods and services tax. Don't blame me for paying that 15% because it's very net vital um, um, that people pay that um, so government be able to get money to, to do many, many other things. Um, but I was in charge of that because I had done my ACC exams and passed um, in a very short period of time. So it was like the organization looked at me and said, okay, it seems as if this is doing well, this guy is doing well. Let's ask him to, to head that project. I headed it, I, I implemented um, GST, I would call VAT in other countries. Um, after that, I was second in charge in the whole of tax department, having like um, close to 200 staff managing that operation. So over that six, seven year period, it was just like, just doing that and doing that. And it meant that I built the skills. I built the natural skills to be able to collect money. I was very rigid and uh, obviously passionate about collecting money for, for, for national development, which I'm very, very proud of. Um, did that for many um, number of years. Then I think even during that time, it was maybe three, four years before I, I decided to go to the private sector that I decided, oh, I could do this. I'm good at it because I, never, I knew that I wasn't going to work for, for, the, for the public sector for a long time. I always loved, I always dabbled in the private sector somehow. Um, but I was thinking of other things, maybe real estate or things like that. But I said to myself, well, you have the expertise now. Do things that could actually help you in that space because you don't have many people that actually are in the space of being a tax expert. Um, um, uh, people work for the government and maybe retire. But you also need somebody like with that kind of expertise that has the thinking of um, uh, the public sector to also come to the private sector. So um, that was the decision, be a tax expert. It meant that um, I had the opportunity, as you did mention earlier, to work for um, the IMF on short-term basis, um, once in a while to other countries, started working for the African Tax Administration Forum. And it's because obviously they saw that I was, I knew what I was doing um, when I was in the tax office. So they would basically put you to do these consultancies um, as you saw some experts in other countries so the moment i did that i would say okay well that's a good thing for me to flee now to go do my passion um and setting up the best one because i do think that it's very vital that somebody like me i, I, I we're in this space so for example the best farm does things that people usually ask us well 
these are things that the government should be doing. And you say no, because at the end of the day, you also need private sector players to be able to help to push the message um, in terms of, um, let's say, taxes. Because at the end of the day, we all know that two things that are certain, taxes and debt. So, so for us, um, what is very important for us at the Bet Farm, not only providing services for our valued clients, which we die for in terms of ensuring that they're compliant, but also help them in navigating that space, not only for tax, but also accounting and, and, and all other, other regulatory advice services. But we also provide a lot of free content um, um, for people that taxpayers, client, um, populace, businessmen, that people will come and say, oh, it's nice that we actually know this. Because for us, we're much freer to be able to do it. You know, when it comes to government, the bureaucracies and all that, sometimes they're not able to do it. So for us, I could just sit in front of a camera, somebody hold the phone in the office. So we're free to be able to do that much easily, to be able to provide that message for everybody. So I think choosing a career path is something to just in a nutshell, you have to be determined and not be wiggling all around to say, okay, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. Um, obviously, when you're much younger, you, you'll be able to do that. Um, but once you start working and find that niche and you have that speciality, because I think what is also important in your career path is that you should be good at what you're doing. The reason why you were able to leave um, your organization that you worked for 14 plus years and be comfortable in your job to come and take this risk similar like me is because you know that you're comfortable in that HR space, in that coaching space. And that's the reason why you're able to do this. What you're doing now is innovative. We don't have people in your space doing what you're doing. So it's very important that when you're doing any job, you try as best as possible to be good at it. Whether you want to be an entrepreneur and your entrepreneurship means you want to sell clothes or you want to do um, come to design um, um, flyers or be a, a, a web designer, be good at it. And when you're good at it, it means that you're able to do it because when you're good at it, it also gives you that passion and that joy and that motivation that you're able to do it. So I think that is also very important in being decisive and not just waffling all around because you do see people, they change from one job to another, one job to another, they, they just pick an opportunity, maybe the highest paying job that they find, et cetera. But when you find niche in where you are, even if you don't want to be an entrepreneur, if you're good at, for example, an accountant in a mining company and you move from one mining company to another, it means that when a bigger opportunity come for that space, you're able to go there because you're good at what you're doing. But just moving all around the place also doesn't help sometimes. So choosing a career path is very important that you need to be decisive and also be specially, um, specialized in what you're doing. Um, actually, this is, honestly speaking, it's, it's out of this world, man. The, the takeaways are like so many, trust me. And I love the part that you, I love the part you mentioned your struggles, which people don't understand. You know, some people don't see the, the, the end product, you don't see what you're going to in life. So it's wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Alfred. Uh, we'll take a stop, short break to check out. Um, this is a good time uh, to subscribe to our YouTube channel and, uh, and to share with, uh, with, with a friend. We'll be back. Do you believe in yourself? As humans, we need to have self-belief to explore life. Having a mindset will help us to set the pace for success. Trust me, you can do whatever you put your mind to if you believe. Guess what? Our coaching programs have helped so many people to master the art of self-belief and take the necessary actions to be successful. So, if you lack self-belief, get in touch and experience our wonderful EBT cooking techniques. <laughs> Cheers and have a wonderful new week. Yes, I, I to well, welcome back to the show. If you're just joining us, you are watching the Bloom Series with me, Alpha Bakal Timbo. Uh, with me on the show is Alfred Akibo Betts, and we're talking about career pathway. Welcome back, Alfred. Um, Alfred, yeah. we have talked about the career pathway in depth, but uh, we need to talk about Sarah Leone. The attitude 
the mindset, the how people perceive about different careers. People don't talk about the plumbers, the carpenters, the painters. These are professions that out there they make a lot of money. Okay, but in Sierra Leone, we don't even look at them. For example, you just mentioned like me doing the ABT room series. This is a good innovative in the sense that you I give people the opportunity to showcase their talents, talk about their expertise. People don't talk about it. So, considering how bad the economy is, so Sierra Leone in particular, what keeps you motivated going through uh, the hassle and uh, being firm at your decision in terms of running pets farm? Um, to start off with, the, the, the points you made about carpenters, painters, artisans like that, they're, they're vital to any economy because um, not everybody will have what we call, let's say, a blue collar job. Not everybody will have a government job. And I think that's also a big challenge in the sense that everybody wants the easy way. Like everybody will think that um, if, you're, if you don't have a job in the government, um, MDA, or you don't have a job in a private sector, you don't make money. And I will tell you that most of the time these people in sectors um they make more money than people that are actually in paying jobs even taxi drivers make more money than people that are paying jobs um uh, for the whole month um but what i think is important is how do we build that skill set right there's obviously these things about tvets um uh, and having these um skilled workers having more skills which is very important because when you do these things, it's important that you also do them well. Because we also have a challenge in Sierra Leone where if you give a masoner to do something, the world will be like this and you want the world to be like that. You want the world to be straight and the world will be bent. bent. And it means that all the time you have to go there, look at it and say, no, correct it again. And obviously it means that you become impatient and, and that's a big challenge. So it means that we need to put in the heads of our youth that it's not only having and I think one of the big issues is not only the, even the private sector, like people think that I need to work for government because that's more secure. So how um, the private sector also can create, and also as I said earlier on, it's that mix between how the um, regulation, the business climate also helps. How the private sector is also be able to create more jobs is what is important because we don't want people depending on working for the government. And also that brings many, many other issues that we will not discuss here. Um, so I think that is very important that we also encourage youth to know that they could make money if they're good at being the best carpenter, the best mason, etc. For example, Nigeria and Ghana um, some time ago banned the importation of um, wooden products because they believe they had a lot of wood and they believe they, that also helped that sector, the furniture sector, or let's say people making furniture. So I think that's important. In terms of the Betts farm, um, for us, I think it's a balance in the sense that, yes, the economy is not doing well as we all hope for. And obviously, when the economy does well, businesses like us will thrive because obviously, if there's more um, uh, companies, it means that more, it, it'd be more demand driven. We'll have a situation wherein people will come to us um, for business. Um, but on the other hand, we have to look at the fact that for any entrepreneur, you need to be able to ensure that you innovate and you change your business model constantly and you continue to strategize. So even in situations where the economy is not going to shut down your business, you find a way to survive. Like some situations like COVID, obviously um, things like hotels could not um, um, function during that particular point in time. So for them, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious at that particular point in time they're not able to operate because obviously the COVID restrictions. But if you're in a situation where in our sector, government is still going to continue to collect taxes, so it means that people still have to continue to pay. So it means that how we're going to tweak our business model in terms of maybe thinking that a lot of people will think that, okay, because the best farm, we do a lot of publicity, etc. We're expensive. Yes, sometimes we could be expensive, but it depends on the type of services we're providing. So we do provide services to really, really small businesses. And because we know that these small businesses will struggle in paying the rates that maybe a bigger company will pay, we ensure that we're able to provide a package to them to help them. Because at the end of the day, we want those businesses to survive and we want them to be able to comply to the taxes. So how you're able to tweak your business model and the way you operate is very, very important. So 
I think for any entrepreneur or any business um, uh, man, you have to ensure that even in an economic downturn, you survive. Because at the end of the day, if you don't survive, you and your employees are going to suffer. Um, so it means that if um, uh, simple things like if you think your electricity bill is much higher and it's because of the air conditioning, cuts of the air conditioning, have a fan and things like that. If you think that maybe you are given a lot of fuel to 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 maybe to for transportation to deliver mail instead of that maybe using a vehicle use an okara use a keke or maybe ask people to deliver mail that is maybe much nearer and maybe just walk there and things like that so these are tweaks that you need to do in terms of maybe cutting your costs look at how you employ people not employing a lot of people that you maybe you will not need obviously that him um, that impacts the employment rates, etc. But you have to do things to survive. That is what is important. But if you have a model wherein you just go one way, you have a problem. A simple example I'll give before I close is that, for example, during COVID time, we had um, a company called The Chemist. And uh, what they do is very, very popular. What they do is actually having programs where they sell alcohol, but it's a mix of playing games and people buy tickets. And when they um, uh, play games, they, they buy alcohol. Because of COVID, obviously, people can't congregate and be in one space. What they did was to tweak their business model and start putting the alcohol in sachets, sachets the cocktails in sachets, and sending them to people and selling them. Their valued customers, the people that love the chemists to go to the chemist, were buying it and sitting in their home, enjoying the Netflix or enjoying the TV, DSTV and drinking the alcohol. So they didn't sit down and say, oh, because we couldn't rent a space and we couldn't create that's our model of playing games and drink and buying cocktails will die. They survived. And after COVID, they now have two sets of business. They have the one business, which is still continuing having the space where people come in and play games, but also another line of business, which is selling co um, cocktails to households so people could buy them. So it's how you also take advantage of the situation. It's also what is very important. Uh, all I would say is, as Sierraians, we are very talented, but uh, I don't think we know how talented we are. You know, just to back up what you just said, for me, I look at uh, Kaya Patri as a as a way of showcasing who you are. That self belief, because all what you just said, Alfred, if you don't have self belief, if it's lacking, it will take you nowhere. Okay, that's why at uh, the bliss bloom series is special because uh it enables us to showcase um uh, top-notch expertise where in the common and showcase what they have been through the struggles and uh, the successful mindset that they have developed now alfred your points they take away there are so many i hope people are taking note of that one because at the end of the day it's about the young the youth coming up okay what will they learn it's about looking at people like, okay, I want to be a lawyer. I'm looking at career. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be an engineer. Are you passionate about it? Do you know what it takes to become one? Okay. These are all the things that you have to look at. For me, I I believe that coaching, Alfred, is very important. Not because I'm a coach, but because it brings out the best out of anyone. Okay. So with your own experience, Alfred, how were you able to put all these things together? Is it because of mentorship? or coaching which one and why well i think what people do see sometimes is a situation wherein they see as you did mention early on they see professionals and uh, in their minds the professional is successful and i wouldn't say i I'm, I, I'm i'm not lucky to be successful but also not so in some of the struggles that people go through it actually gets in where they are and i think what is important there is that in having a successful career you need to be able to go through those struggles. Um, and no, it's something like no pain, no gain. You have to go through it. So it means that it doesn't mean that it's always been rosy. You have situations wherein you are in difficult um, situations in your job, um, uh, and maybe you have to um, play um, uh, work out the, the office politics. I'm not talking about national politics here. Um, work out the national uh, the office politics in navigating that, um, in ensuring that you. You work well with people you work with, but also when there's that little power struggle in the office, whether you are much lower in the hierarchy or up in the hierarchy, you're able to navigate that. You'll have a situation, you'll have situations wherein you're disheartened by 
maybe people not appreciating the efforts you put in in terms of um, the work you do. Um, so you have to go through that because not all the time you'll have a boss that will say, oh, pat you on your back, say, oh, great job. Some bosses feel intimidated by what you're doing. Some colleagues feel intimidated by what you're doing if you're doing great and things like that. So you have to be able to navigate those situations. But also be ready. Those, those situations are the things that make you much better. Um, I think that are very, that's very important. So anytime you, you have a, a negative situation, whether you're an entrepreneur that is doing maybe only business or maybe you're in a situation in an office, you have to be able to know that that is a lesson that you've learned and how you deal with it is what is important in acts of helping your career go. I think that, that is very important. For me, I, I've never had like um, an active mentor. And interestingly speaking, I remember um, we did call you and you, you did a coaching session for the team um, um, through one of our ideation sessions that we have every Wednesday. So, we, you know, as you know, we have these ideation sessions where any of our staff can come in and talk about any topic. We not only tax and accounting, like any topic, which also helps to improve um, the team. And when you did come in, you, you, um, uh, you spoke about coaching. And interestingly speaking, our ideation session today was coaching and mentoring, which is very important. And I did mention to the team that um, I've never had like an active, active mentor, but I've had people that I've looked up to and people that I've worked with who kind of have mentored me in, the, in, in what I am today. Obviously, my, my father, my parents were, were big things. Um, uh, and, and interestingly speaking, even people that you're close to, um, like, your, like your spouse, my wife, for example, I'll be able to, to ask her questions and bound, bounce ideas off her. But also, like professionally speaking, I've worked with people where they've, they've reached the peak of their career. So it means that um, you're able to talk to those people when you're in difficult, difficult situations. You also um, will look up to them and follow their footsteps. So it means that even now when you're maybe a much senior professional, you have to be aware that people will look at what you're doing and simple things like, do you come to work early? Are you careless in actually meeting deadlines? Trust me, if you're that boss that doesn't want to put in the work, people generally will say, ah, but yeah, that need, need to work. So basically, and that also, <laughs> anything you do is that you're impacting that person's career. So even if you're not an active mentor for that person, that person basically, just like our child in a household, if there's chaos in a household, highly like that kid will, that child will grow up with chaos. If there's a, it's a calm household, the kid will grow up with structure and things like that. So I never had like an active, active mentor, but I always looked up to people. Um, but I think the message in this particular question is, is ensuring that you know that there's struggles there when you're, when you're building your career. So you have to ensure that you take those struggles because it's not always perfect and ensure that you build on those. Okay. Thank you very much, Alfred. And uh, I appreciate your insight on the topic yet again. Um, you know, knowing your right career um, will help you to set specific goals. That's the most important thing, okay? And, uh, and the thing is, if you don't believe in coaching, um, you are missing out. Because what I would say is this. For me, my transformation, coaching helped me a lot. Okay, when I went to, to uh, overseas for my studies, when I came back, the, the struggles that I went through, quitting my job, coaching helps. And I, am, I became the best I am today because of coaching. Okay, and I'm very, very grateful. I, I always had up with new coaches because I needed to, like, to work on my skills, to be more innovative, and uh, to just use those such powers for me to become the better person as in every day. Okay, so with that, uh, Alfred, I'm like we've gone through the time and it's, the, the conversation is so so good. But uh, I will say let's head down to the the comment section to see what people have been saying. If there are questions for Alfred or for me, we will discuss them as well. But uh, all I'm saying here is uh, people are just saying well done. Um, so that's the thing, and it's very interesting because. You and I know, Alfred, um, our country we have witnessed so many negative uh, situations, okay? Um, for me, if you followed me on my social media handles, I don't talk about, I don't believe in washing our dirty linens in the public. It's not a good thing, okay? That's how I thought when I was growing up, and I would, it was instilled in me, and I believe in that one. 
if you want to talk about problems, we should talk about it in the low key fashion where in we can listen to each other. Talk about listening to each other, Alfred, before we, we wrap up this program. What do you think will improve Sierra Leone in the grand scheme of things? Just out of the blue, what do you think will definitely improve Sierra Leone in terms of youths uh, seeking their, their right career pathway, walking through the right career pathway, and doing the things that are necessary for them to improve their lives? Well, one thing that people maybe sometimes don't recognize is the fact that all of us, in our little ways, impact the economy. Yeah, it's, 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 it's something that I guess people sometimes don't even know. A simple example, if you go to an office building and that office building has 100 people in there, and uh, it means that if you take the number of hours for a day, let's say eight working hours, it means that all of them should put in 800 working hours. And if we equate 800 working hours to a particular output level of efficiency, it means that um, uh, if you are able to, if everybody works properly for the eight hours, obviously not all the time people work eight hours, even the most efficient um, person in the world, it means that um, taking the wastages or people going for lunch or bathroom breaks, et cetera, it means that let's say they're processing, let's say you have these 800 people processing applications, let's say any any application, let's say passport application, anything. I don't want to even make it about anything that's a government service, let's say anything. It means that if those 800 people put in the work and they have to process approximately 1,500 applications for a day, it means that 1,500, if it's, if it's a private company, that company will make money if they process those 1,500 applications for those 100 people in the building. Huh? Now, so it means that they will have money for 1,500 forms that they, they process. If the generator is not on, or there is a cut in electricity, or those people don't work effectively and only work to process 1,000 forms in a day, that company loses 50% of its revenue because some people basically have put their hands in their heads and maybe just relaxing in the office. So it means that for each and every person, and so this is just like one building, 100 workers. And when you take the thousands of workers or maybe the millions of workers working in Sierra Leone, if all of them don't work effectively or create value to the economy, even the person that is a wheelbarrow or let's say somebody that has, let's say we, we, those guys that maybe carry um, 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 goods down at the port, let's say rice, they're offloading a ship. If it's going to take, if it's approximated that that ship should take one day to offload because of the number of hours, right? And it takes three days. The people that own the ship, they're going to pay two extra days for not utilizing that ship. So it means that it's affecting the economy. So one thing people should recognize, young adults, young youths, etc., is the fact that you impact everything. It's not only about government. All of us, in terms of how we work, the way we work effectively, we impact things. So generally speaking, I think not going into all the other things in terms of maybe what private sector should do, what your government should do, is that what you could bring to the country is what is important. There's a, there's a JFK saying on that. I can't remember the exact saying, but I think it was something like not only what your country could do for you, but also what you could do for your country in line, something like that. I think it was JFK. I hope I'm not missing who, who, who said that. But I think that is very important for you to be able to understand that you also impact the, the country and the economy or how the country goes. So I think that is also something that is very um, important for us to be able to understand. So obviously, we're not going to the other things, but that, I think, is one key message that I think is important for people listening. Timo, you're on mute. Um, before we end the, the conversation, Alfred, there's a question here for you from uh, Melvin Emily King, uh, which says, Alfred, with your experience, is there, is there on, the, on, the, on the on the bottom of the screen, Alfred? And uh, I want you to, to answer this question before we, we, we wrap up. Okay. So just so just a quick tease there. He's, he's from grammar school, so Dayoko. Um, um, <laughs> the oldest school in, in West, oldest men's school in West Africa. So thanks, Melvin. Um, uh, with respect to that, it's 
So when you look at your career, I think you need to think about in, in, in terms of, let's say you work in the public sector, you want to move out um, into the private sector. One thing I said earlier on is that you need to home your skills. You need to ensure that when you're going out there, you home your skills. It's also easier, as I said earlier on, in terms of if you do something in line with what you did in the public sector. So for me, it was much easier because I was collecting tax revenue and I knew the tax laws, I knew tax administration. So for me, what the value I bring to my clients is that um, I'm different from any other tax advice. We're different from any other tax advice firm because of my experience in the sense of not only looking at a tax advice side of things, but also looking at it as how NIA will look at it, right? Um, in terms of the government's calculator there. So it means that I'm able to advise my client that, look, NIA will be very hard on you if you do this. So you don't need to do it. Do it the correct way so things are much easier for you, things like that. So I think being committed in the public sector, doing your work properly, homing those skills, and building your skills. So another thing also before, like it was a three, four year plan in me moving out of the public sector. And what I did notice is that when you're in that motion of just doing work and uh, maybe collecting, doing what you're doing, you naturally not all the time home some certain skills. So one of the things I was very crazy about um, just before I left was doing a lot of short courses, like doing a lot of courses on Coursera, like data analytics, um, leadership courses, customer service, because these are things that maybe sometimes you don't have in your current job, but you need them for the private sector. So it's very important that apart from the hard skills that you have in terms of the technical ability you have, it's also homing some soft skills that will be very useful for you. And just like envisioning that, okay, if they're doing this, what value can I create to make it better? So one thing in the NI meeting their target is people filing their returns to declare that this is what they're paying. And secondly, people paying. So in the public sector, how am I, in the private sector now, how am I going to ensure that the clients I have are compliant with taxes? So I'll remind them all the time to ensure that they pay their taxes on time, um, they file on time and things like that. And it's a win-win situation for everybody, for me, the clients, but also um, for the government and people paying. Yeah, and somebody did mention, um, Ella did mention, Eline, El El sorry, did mention about the work environment. Yes. Some work environments don't allow you um, to thrive, right? And you need to find a work environment that allows you to thrive. It's not all the time you will have that work environment because not all the time you will have a job um, to be able to move on. And it's also not all the time it would be a good idea for you to just skip jobs. But the point I made early on, it's how you're able to navigate that and build that experience. Sometimes a bad boss is great for your career in the sense that, if you know that person wants something as at yesterday, let's say, for example, it gives you a deadline and the deadline you know is impossible. That boss kind of, even if you're looking at that boss as a bad boss, the boss is helping you grow. If you're in an environment where there's a lot of patriarchy, which is a big problem, especially for women, or there's a lot of um, issues there about sexual harassment and things like that, those are environments that you should not be happy to be in but you're able also to navigate that by maybe finding a way to tell the boss directly that you shouldn't be spoken to in some kind of demeaning way. Um, and maybe taking that to HR. Sometimes HR will not listen, but you need to stand for it. You know what I mean? You need, you need, you need also for them to know that you're not that kind of person who will take that kind of nonsense. But also planning yourself. So it's an environment that is really, really toxic. You see from top management to down that they're not going to change, they're not in line with your values, then you can switch careers. But also knowing how to navigate that space is also necessary for you because just like how I tell my children all the time, then this cushy house. But when they go out to the world, people are not going to love them all the time. So they have to find a way how to navigate that and deal with that. Obviously, we helping them. So I think that is also very important for you to be able to know. With that, we have come to the end of the show. Thank you so much, Alfred, uh, for being in conversation with me. A huge thanks to everyone who is watching the, this live. Take care. Until we meet again, I remain humble. Cheers.
Thank you very much, Alpha. All right.